Hello there. Welcome to another presentation in the Healthcare of Decline 3 course. In today's lesson, I will introduce you to cellular regulation as a concept by talking about the development of cancer. Before we proceed to our discussion, I want you to take the time to look at the objectives and outcomes for this module. <coughs> cellular regulation refers to all functions carried out within a cell to maintain homeostasis, including its responses to extracellular signals such as the work of hormones, cytokines, and neurotransmitters, and the way each cell produces an intracellular response to these extracellular signals. The scope of cellular regulation is a continuum ranging from normal cell growth to malignant neoplasia. Cancer is a common health problem in the United States and around the world, um, and Canada as well, affecting about 1.8 million people every year. It is a life-threatening disease causing many deaths. However, early detection can facilitate treatment and recovery from the disease. Now, let's look at the normal cell morphology and how cancer cells evolve out of these normal cells. Normal cellular reproduction and growth is a controlled process, the rate of which varies with the type of tissue involved. For example, your skin tissue or cells divide more rapidly and they die off more quickly as compared to the tissue in, say, your eye. Cells divide by two processes. The two types of cell division are mitosis, which is mainly for increasing the number of cells during growth and maintenance, and the second one is meiosis for sexual reproduction. Meiosis only occurs with the cells of the sperm and the ovum. All cells has a normal biology, and normal cells are cells that contain a complete set of chromosomes. They are non-migratory and orderly with growth that is well regulated and are also very well differentiated to perform specific functions. So for example, the tissue in your heart is specific to the heart and it allows the heart to function by pumping blood and then the tissue in the nose is also different and is specific to that particular organ. Once cells are mature, they die off by an intrinsic process called apoptosis, which is a kind of, a kind of programmed cell death. So when cells divide and mature, then they intrinsically trigger a process that leads to cell death um, so that it does not overgrow. Accurate intracellular and extracellular signaling is required for normal cellular replication and growth. And there are surveillance mechanisms which exist to detect and correct any errors. Cellular mutation that can lead to neoplasia occur when mistakes go undetected or uncorrected during the cell division and growth. And this is what leads to the development of neoplasia. So neoplasms can be either benign, which is just an excessive growth of normal cells and they are not capable of met metastasis, or neoplasms can be malignant, which will be abnormal cells that are capable of metastasis. Although nurses are not cytologists, it is important for nurses to understand the characteristics of benign and malignant cells. So let's now look at some characteristics of benign versus malignant um, cells. 
Benign tumor cells are normal cells growing in the wrong place at the wrong time, basically. Examples include moles, fibroid tumors, skin tags, endometriosis, nasal polyps, which do not pose any major threat to the, cancer, uh, to the patient. This is because benign cells usually are encapsulated and they have specific morphology and specific functions. So they, although they are not normal cells, um, they are similar to the parent cell and they behave similarly to the parent cell. They are normally differentiated to have specific functions like the parent or mother cells and they do not metastasize because um, of the fact that they have contact inhibition. On the other hand, malignant or cancer cells are abnormal cells that serve no useful purpose or function and are harmful to normal body tissues. And this is so because cancer cells are rarely encapsulated, which means that they can grow and grow and grow without any restrictions, and making them very invasive and expansive, leading to metastasis because they can invade other cells and cause the other cells to behave like them. The consequence of cell pathology, as noted earlier, leads to the development of cancer and stages of development of a malignant neoplasm are the initiation process where the cell kind of branches off and starts to form its own identity, um, just to use it as an example. And then there is the promotion stage and the progression stage. The promotion stage is where there is an overgrowth and then the progression will push it to be undifferentiated and so that will cause the metastasis. Without successful treatment of the malignancy, the client will suffer a web of consequences and this may include the signs and symptoms that we will see with a cancer patient. And so we are going to see fatigue, weight loss, pain, organ failure, and even death. And other psychosocial consequences comprise of fear associated with cancer diagnosis, stress, anxiety, and changes in family dynamics. For example, if the partner who is the breadwinner uh, becomes sick with cancer, that means that the other partner will now have to take on those roles and so there are conflict in, in the roles and that causes some um, changes in the family dynamics. Or a child may be forced to take care of a parent who has cancer thereby assuming the parental role um, even though he or she is a child. The client may also experience changes in self-image related to the treatment of cancer such as hair loss, um, also known as alopecia, loss of function of body parts and chronic pain which can affect interpersonal relationships as well. Cancer treatment can also cause financial challenges related to treatment cost or loss of income if you or a client develops cancer and they cannot work anymore, they lose that source of revenue or income and that becomes problematic for the family depending on the family dynamics. Nursing care for the client with cancer sh also should center on reducing the consequences of mal malignancy as well as the effects stemming out of these consequences. So nursing care is mainly focused on reducing the stress, anxiety, and also helping um, the family to direct them to support and resources so that they can cope with their cancer diagnosis. There are many risk factors that can contribute to impaired cellular regulation and for that matter the development of cancer. Um, older adults have the greatest risk for cancer because the probability of 
developing cancer increases exponentially with age as all the body systems becomes weak and the regulatory mechanisms um, start to more, more function. However, cancer is now prevalent in all age groups, including children, and so um, we should expect to see cancer in all across the lifespan. Additionally, developing cancer is compounded by individual risk factors such as smoking or tobacco use. Smoking and tobacco use is the leading cause of lung cancer. And poor nutrition can also cause immunocompromisation, which may lead to the development of cancer. Excess weight and sedentary lifestyle, which contributes to excess weight. And then exposure to environmental carcinogens, such as sunlight, can cause skin cancer um, if you are exposed to ultraviolet light. Or pollutants in the air, um, such as if there is a radiation accident and it spills into the air and you breathe it. There is also some form of radiation in soil, water, and even the food that we eat. And medical treatments such as radiation treatments um, are all linked to cancer. Individual risk factors may also include genetic links and infectious agents such as H. Py pylori, um, which causes gastric cancer. Hepatitis B and C viruses can also cause liver cancer, and in the same vein, HPV can also cause oropharyngeal and anal cancer. As we discuss examples while talking about care for the client with cancer, I want you to be thinking of the associations between the cancer types that we will focus on and then the risk factors and spe um, that are associated with them. So we'll be linking the disease process to the lifestyle of the client. As always, nursing care begins with history taking and assessment, which forms part of the general assessment of cancer. So with history, when obtaining a history, um, the nurse should note the most commonly reported signs and symptoms associated with neoplasia, which are the presence of a mass or a lesion, um, unexplained symptoms such as bleeding, pain, cough, or fatigue, and changes in major body functions, um, such as changes in Bowel, bowel pattern and also changes in urinary pattern if they have difficulty urinating or if they have um, constipation, which is different from their baseline. Then the nurse will proceed to do a physical assessment and physical examination should include a general assessment of all systems or should be a focused assessment of the affected system if the symptoms um, are directive enough to point to a particular system, such as if they have changes in bowel pattern, then you will be focusing on the gastrointestinal, um, gastrointestinal system. Findings may vary depending on the type of cancer. For example, Clinical findings associated with neoplasia may include visible lesions um, for skin cancer and then physical asymmetry or palpable masses and the presence of body in the stool, um, urine or on pelvic examination. That is why when we were teaching you health assessment, we always told you to um, compare and contrast and see what are the differences so you know if there are any changes. Diagnostic tests include radiographic tests which may be um, magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography or CT scan, and then radio isotope scans, ultrasonography and diagnostic mammography. Radiographic tests are used to determine the borders of the tumor and depending on the type of test being done, such as if the patient is going for a magnetic resonance imaging, which 
uses a um, magnetic field, you have to assess and make sure that they don't have any implanted devices such as metals, stents, or any surgeries um, such as hip or knee replacements. So you do an MRI interview to determine if they have any of these um, implanted devices um, and then you report to the provider. Sometimes for some of these tests, the patient will have to be NPO also and you will have to notify them. And if they are undergoing ultrasound or ultrasonography depending on the site that the ultrasound is being performed, um, they may be asked to change their positions and so you will be assisting with that. Lab tests may include complete blood count or CBC and a chemistry panel. Um, CBC can be very useful in diagnosing cancers such as leukemia and other hematologic malignancies. However, when it's used for other cancers, it just gives information about the overall health of the clan, such as do they have adequate red blood cells, do they have any infections um, which may elevate the high blood cell count, or are they at risk for bleeding if the platelet is slow. So we look at all these to determine the plan of care for this patient that has cancer. There can also be genetic or tumor marker tests which are specific to the type of cancers. So for example, when we talk about prostate cancer, we have the prostate specific um, an antigen that we can test for to see if a person has prostate cancer. An increase in the tumor marker test is indicated for a malignant neoplasm. So as I said, if the PSA is elevated, then it means that there is the potential um, for prostate cancer. And with treatment, we can also use the tumor marker test, such as the PSA, to determine if the treatment is effective or not. And then, apart from this test, there can also be a direct visualization um, of the cancer tumor, and this can be done by endoscopy. An example would be a colonoscopy, which is done to determine if a patient has any cancers related to the GI tract. So if a patient is going for any GI procedures, um, you are going to keep the patient NPO, you will obtain a consent, and then if there is bowel prep, you will make sure that the bowel prep is effective and it being effective means that they should have liquid stool which is clear um, for consistently before they go for the procedure. Other than that, the scope will not be able to visualize anything and it will be inconclusive and the patient will have to repeat the procedure again. So you want to be really sure that the patient's bowel prep has been effective. There can also be um, cytologic studies um, which includes biopsies and depending on the site of the, biopsy, of, of the biopsy, there are various interventions that are going to be associated with that and we will talk about these more as when we discuss the specific examples um, for this course. So once a cancer is found, then we have to clinically stage and classify the cancer. So cancer tumors can be classified as primary or secondary tumors. Primary tumor is primary if the tissue from which it arose or the pa parent tissue can be identified. On the other hand, secondary tumor, also known as metastatic um, cancer, results from cells that have migrated from the primary tumor to another location into other tissues. Then once we determine if the cancer is from a primary cell or is secondary to another primary cancer, then we can use the TNM 
classification to determine if there is lymph node um, involvement or metastasis. So the TNM classification is the most widely used system for clinical staging of cancer during diagnosis. And the T represents um, mainly the primary tumor and the N represents the lymph node involvement with the M representing metastasis. For staging the tumor as primary tumor, there are various classifications that can be used and you have the TX which means that the tumor cannot be measured. You have the T0, which means that no evidence of primary tumor has been found or the tumor cannot be found because you can have some secondary tumors that the primary tumor is very difficult to find. Then you have TIS, which means tumor in situ or tumor in situ, however you may pronounce it meaning that the malignant cells are only within the superficial layer of the tissue and no extension into deeper, deeper tissue. So this may be relate, relatable to skin cancer. Then you go from T1 to T4, um, which is a description of the primary tumor based on the size and all the invasion into near, nearby structures. So the higher the T number, um, the larger the tumor and the more it has grown into nearby tissues. So as you can tell, a T1 will be less invasive compared to a T4 or the size of a T2 may be smaller as compared to a T3. After this, then we determine or the provider will determine if there is any regional lymph nodes that are involved. And just as the primary tumor classification, this also goes from NX to N3, with NX meaning that, meaning that um, nearby lymph nodes cannot be evaluated. And N0 means that there is no evidence of cancer cells in regional lymph nodes. And N1, to N3 um, describing the size, location, and all the number of lymph nodes which are involved. And as comparing to the, um, the, the T or the tumor classification, the higher the N number, the greater the number of lymph, lymph nodes that are affected and the more extensive the lymph node involvement. So N0 will mean that there are no lymph nodes affected. So for example, if I have breast cancer and it's staged as N0, then it means that the lymph nodes under my armpit have not been affected. And that will also tell the provider as to what interventions need to be done um, during the surgery. Then we come to M, which represents metastasis. Once again, MX means that metastasis cannot be evaluated. And then M0 means there is no evidence of metastasis. And then M1 um, describes the extent of the metastasis. And you can have M1, M2, M3. And the higher the number of attached to the M, then the more extensive the metastasis. So how can we prevent cancer? Individuals might be able to mitigate the risk of cancer by avoiding known carcinogens. So um, if you have medications that are known to be carcinogenic, um, household products may have some chemicals that have been um, studied and known to cause cancer. And so avoiding those will help prevent cancer. And then modifying associated risk. So if I know that I, I have a genetic predisposition to lung cancer, then maybe me not smoking in addition to that predisposition and that risk will help me not to develop the cancer. So life lifestyle changes 
and then removing the arthritic tissue such as a um, prophylactic mastectomy. A lot of women are opting to have prophylactic mastectomy if they know that they have a higher chance of developing breast cancer. Then we can also do chemo prevention um, by taking certain medications to help us and um, prevent the onset of cancer. Vaccination is another way of preventing cancer. For example, when you take the HPV vaccination, you can prevent the cancers which are related to the HPV virus. There are also some secondary prevention methods and although these will not prevent the development of cancer, we call them preventive measures because it helps us to detect the cancer in the early stages so that it can be taken care of. And this includes regular screening. So I have some questions for you. Quiz time. A nurse is assessing a patient with a genetic history of cancer. Which nursing assessment finding is most concerning? Okay. And the answer is B. A nagging cough with hoarseness is one of the seven warning signs of cancer. And given the genetic predisposition um, of this patient, if they have a nagging cough, then it means that we should assess it further. Blood pressure of 138 on 60 is normal for most patients, although the systolic blood pressure is a precursor to hypertension or is prehypertensive. And then muscle tension in the cervical spine is not really um, related to the development of cancer. And nasal congestion for two weeks, you all know, can be as a result of allergies. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. The nurse understands that normal cells and banal cells share which characteristics? Select all that apply. All right, and so the answers are A, B, C, and D because normal cells and banal cells do not migrate. They have orderly growth and they demonstrate right adherence and have specific morphology and function. Um, a cancerous cells, on the other hand, will have cells, um, cell nucleus which is larger than that of a normal cell and the cancer cell is smaller than a normal cell. The nucleus occupies much of the space within the cancer cell, creating a large nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So know the basic um, characteristics of the normal and abnormal or malignant and the benign cells. All right, let's move on to question number three. Which of the following does the nurse recognize as a primary cancer prevention strategy? Okay, so this is talking about prevention. And the answer is D. Okay, remember we talked about prophylactic removal of tissues that may be at risk. So removal of a mole on the shoulder is going to prevent the patient from getting the skin cancer or from the mole developing into the cancer. The other choices listed are secondary prevention strategies. And as I said, this does not really prevent the development of the cancer, but it helps us to identify them early so we can treat it. All right. So Thank you for listening to this presentation. I will discuss specific examples with differences between treatment for each exemplar in our next session. Um, I will also discuss the treatment options specifically related to surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy in the next session. If you have any questions, once again, you can always email me 
or form the habit of writing down your questions and asking during the in-class activities.